um, I always get quite nervous talking, so um, the colleague sitting next to me at the table had me doing deep breathing, so I'm nice and relaxed now. Um, I'm really excited to be here, um, and thank you for the invitation from the Health, Quality and Safety Commission to talk about some of the work that I've been doing. Um, and there's a great group of people here, so it's been really good talking to some of the people in some of the breaks. Um, what I'd like to share with you is about some of the work that we've been doing around involving patients and families in the purpose of improving healthcare services and to give you an opportunity to think about some of the work that you're doing and whether you can incorporate what we're doing. So I've worked in the healthcare system for about 10 years. I um, originally worked at Waitamata DHB, um, spent a few years doing other things and have been working at Auckland District Health Board. And one of the, um, there's two questions that I and a lot of my colleagues have really grappled with. So it's how can we understand people's experiences of our healthcare service and how can we work together to improve them? And one of the traditional ways that we seek feedback from patients is through patient satisfaction surveys and people have talked about that a little bit this morning. Um, that is um, a thing that people are moving away from a lot in co-design because we're looking at things that are more proactive and that involve people more not just only in identifying their experiences but looking at how you can actually work together to improve experiences. So a number of years ago, I was lucky enough to go to a seminar by Lynn Ma. Someone mentioned Lynn this morning. And Lynn Ma used to work as a director of innovation at the National <coughs> Health Service. She now works at Ko Awatea in um, County's Manukau District Health Board. And she was giving a talk on experience-based design. It was something I hadn't heard much about. Um, but was interested in learning more about. And I often go to seminars and I, you know, when I write an application to go, as you have to for DHBs and say what you want to learn, I always write down that I want to come away inspired. But actually quite often I don't. Um, but at the end of Lynn Ma's talk, I was so inspired about the work that she was doing that I immediately went back to work to see if we could do something similar in New Zealand. Because at that point it was very new. So um, we did some work in the breast service at uh, Waitamata DHB. And then, um, so we worked with um, clinicians, patients, families, consumers, and we actually had a designer come on board, and that's a service designer. And after we'd finished that piece of work, we wanted to write it up because we altered it quite a lot from what had happened in the UK um, to take into account the New Zealand context. So we developed um, a toolkit which is called Health Service Co-Design. And that really provides a framework and tools that can be used to answer the questions that I talked about before. So Health Co-Design is really about understanding the experience of people going through the healthcare process and also making the changes together. So um, when we went to write our hard work, we identified with the designers what we saw as six key phases in the process. Now we've numbered them one to six, but in actual fact, um, it's more of a circle than a linear process, but um, that's just what I did for this presentation. So I was going to talk to you briefly about each of the steps. In the co-design work, in an ideal world, um, we do a period of engagement. And when we're talking about engagement, we talk about establishing and maintaining meaningful relationships with people that use the service or potentially could use the service during the whole project. And I think in the work that we've done, it's quite important to acknowledge that the relationships can change over time. 
like uh, in the work that we did with the breast cancer service, some of the mainly women were um, quite unwell and so sometimes they wanted to be involved quite heavily at the beginning of a project or be involved in implementing a particular idea but they didn't necessarily want um, the constancy of involvement right the way through the project. So in an ideal world, that engagement would happen before the project begins. So before you've decided exactly what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. Um, the next phase is actually planning. So it's working with patients and staff to establish your project goals. And certainly if you're able to involve people at the planning stage, you're likely to get much more buy-in throughout the work that you do. It's not always possible but that's certainly what we advocate for in the work that we do. The third phase is explore, which is about capturing and ex understanding patient experiences or services and identifying ideas for change. There's a number of tools that are used here. They often come from design, so there's things around um, patient or family shadowing. There's um, something new we're trying, which is called intercept interviews. Um, you can use journey-based mapping. There is a lot more detail on the website here, healthcodesign.org.nz, which has all the tools on it. Um, and there's a toolkit as well, which I can talk about later. The fourth phase is develop. So it's working to turn the ideas into improvements. So um, what you do is you, you take all the ideas you've got, you possibly run some workshops, you do some testing and some prototyping and you come up with the ideas together. So that's often where it differs from traditional improvement work where you, you get people's feedback about a service and you say, thank you very much, we'll take it from here. Um, there's the, the decide phase, which is when you've got some improvements and you decide which ones to implement. <laughs> and then there's the phase of change, which is actually implementing the changes. So I was going to talk of about some of the examples of the co-design work that we do, but having given you um, what the phases are, it's also important to acknowledge that co-design can take many forms. So there are some instances in our work where we have the freedom to run a project right from beginning to end, where we can go through and use all those phases, but there's other times when work is already underway and we can only do some of the phases, so it's important to acknowledge it we're all working within different contexts and we have different you know, amounts of time and budget. There's also different ways you can use co-design. So you might want to use it in um, reviewing how a service works. You might want to look at a community education program. It might be a particular product, so designing IV poles or possibly a new mask for radiation, head and neck cancer. Um, so you can use it in all different areas. So the first um, project I want to talk about was conversation accounts. So this is a piece of work which is a bit of publicity around at the moment, uh, the second phase of it anyway. And the challenge for the organisation was how can we encourage conversations about planning for death and dying amongst families and in communities so that people get the care they want at the end of their lives. So that was the challenge that we had. And often a project, a co-design project, will start with a challenge statement, which is something like this. So here's what actually happened in the project. Before I got, became involved, there were several consumer workshops. And those were to understand the experience of advanced care planning and find out what people would like done differently. And one of the ideas which came from a consumer was that they wanted to be able to educate, go out to their own communities and talk about planning for death and dying, but they didn't have the tools and resources or the skills to do so. We were able to get some funding from Health Quality Safety Commission. Um, we recruited some consumer representatives and that was quite a long process. And then we held four practical co-design workshops to develop the resources and the training. So those workshops are run by a service designer and they included using lots of hands-on tools, some of which I talked about on the toolkit I mentioned. And at the end of that, there was a 52-page toolkit developed 
and a two-day training package, and that was actually tested. Um, 27 volunteers were trained, and they held 19 community sessions. And this was just one of the quotes from someone who attended the session. They said they found it, found it very enlightening. Um, it truly opened their eyes as to what is available to people facing end of life, and so on. What's, in, what's happened since then is there's another piece of work that's been done, which is a conversation that counts day, which is a national day, which is coming up on Wednesday. It's um, organised by a colleague, Lee Manson, and that, that day is um, a chance for people to hold conversations within their families and communities. And the, the campaign for that day, which is like a postcard campaign, was actually developed in consultation with consumers and we went out to a retirement village because it's targeted at active older people and held a co-design workshop there. The next example I want to talk about is ward redesign. This is a totally different context for a piece of co-design work. So it's an Auckland District Health Board. There was, um, it was a piece of work which was already underway where they wanted to design a new ward which combined bone marrow, transplant and haematology wards into one place. So they were part way through their work, they'd hired an architect and they had some plans drawn up and then they decided they really wanted, needed to know about the patient and family experience. So the challenge was how can we understand the patient and family experiences points of significance and the impact of these on the design of the ward. So I became involved with colleagues in this piece of work. So what we actually did, so this wasn't a totally ideal situation because we hadn't been involved from the start, but we held 10 journey-based interviews. So how journey-based interviews differ from traditional questionnaires is that they actually um, follow the patient journey through from when they became ill or unwell through to the end of their experience, however they define that. And they identify points of significance in the journey. They get people to reflect on their experience. And these interviews also involved asking people for their comments about specific design features in the ward. So some of those interviews were done on the ward and some were done in people's homes, and people had the option of having family there. So there were six themes identified. I'm just going to talk briefly about those. So this, what we came out, we came out with six themes, which was that the ward needed to be welcoming, family-friendly, compassionate, nourishing, quiet, and connected. And underneath all of those themes, there were a number of design principles to be incorporated into the ward. And one of the beauties of this method is the richness of the data that you can get from people. One thing that came up was we talked to a number of patients who had, had were having chemotherapy. And one of the things with chemotherapy is that you develop quite a strong sense of smell and smells can really irritate you and make you feel quite nauseous. And on that ward there was also a kitchen which wasn't very well ventilated and people often came in to cook food for their um, patients, partly because the food in the hospital isn't gourmet type food. Um, and so when they re-looked at their design, one of the things they did was build in the strongest ventilation system they could in that kitchen facility to enable people to cook and people not to get sick at the same time. So you do get a lot of richness of data. And um, what happened after that was we actually had, um, we invited people to come to a meeting with the project team and the architect and we had um, a couple of people attend that because this group was a very unwell group and the patients, um, that patients had to sign off the design before it could go any further. It was a really interesting project. So I wanted to talk a little bit about 
some of the work that's happening overseas. So last year I was very lucky to go on a Winston Churchill Fellowship and I spent a month in the UK and Australia looking at the work that they were doing over there. The Red Cross co-design is an area that's very new and it's changing quite a lot. So it's quite important to keep up with the different trends and learning and also the evidence base. So it's just going to talk about two organisations. This is one of my favourite places to visit. Um, this was in Sheffield in England, partly because they gave me lots of cups of tea. Yeah. I like my cups of tea. I spent a day there with a colleague. So the user-centred healthcare design is actually a organisation that's run out of a university. It's actually collaboration. So it's a collaboration between the university design students and healthcare organisations, so hospitals mainly. Um, they do some really good work on bringing together patients, healthcare staff, families and communities to understand real life experiences of healthcare. They initially started doing some work with looking at older health services for people with older health. Um, and they've, they do a lot of, they've done a lot of work with product design as well. Uh, one of the students was working on an enzyme dispenser, which was a really interesting project. And I'll talk about one of their projects. So this is the project that really caught my eye. It was diabetes and young people. So this is a project where the challenge was to design innovative health services for people with type 1 diabetes. And the photo is actually of one of the workshops they held. So the really interesting thing about what they did is they held a series of workshops, but all the workshops were designed around popular culture references, so you know, like TV, um, media and things like that. One of the fun things they did at the start was they did a body mapping exercise, so they got um, young people to draw a big, you know, outline of a body to identify um, the parts in the body where they had symptoms or were hurt or how diabetes affected them and put them on with post-it notes and then put those onto a board and use those body maps to explain how they were feeling to their parents and families and professionals which was really a useful exercise. They did other things too. They um, came up with lots of ideas. They used the X factor um, to narrow down the ideas. And they had a dragon's den. I don't know how many of you have watched Dragon's Den, where you pitch your ideas to, you know, three very rich people and they give you money. This is slightly different. They I think pitch your ideas to professionals and got some feedback on that. Um, and since then they've developed a really good video. If you go to the website uchd.org.uk, you can probably find the video that way or I can get you a link. And it's of the young people talking about a future service and what they'd like it to be. And there's also some things on there about what they've done. So it's a really interesting piece of work. One of the issues with um, this organisation, Uses Centre Healthcare Design, is that they had limited funding. So funding was due to run out at the end of last year. So I'm not quite sure what they're doing right now, but they still answer my emails. So. The other organisation I'm going to talk briefly about is the Design Council. So this is a totally different kettle of fish. They're based in London. It's got a really flash office. Um, they are a charity, but they make, that's how they describe themselves, charity made up of designers. They don't just focus on health, so they actually focus on all different social issues. So it might be designing out crime, or looking at sustainable water use, all those sort of things. So their role you know, within the country is they're interested in thinking and insight around design, they're interested in tackling big challenges, they mentor leadership teams, and they have um, interested in sustainable places and communities. And their website address is up there, designcouncil.org.nz. So I was going to talk briefly about one of the projects that they um, did in health, 
And what I was particularly interested in is not so much a topic, but the method they used. But the issue that they wanted to address was how can we reduce violence and aggression in accident and emergency departments through the use of co-design. At the time, in the NHS, they had more than 150 incidents of violence and aggression, and it was prevalent <coughs> in high-pressure areas such as accident and emergency. So what they do for all their projects is they have a seven-step process. The first thing they actually do is they go and understand the frontline issues how they did that in this case, um, they do some quite a lot of detailed paper-based work, so getting data, you know, looking at what's been previously done. They then hire um, ethnographers who actually go and spend, I think they spent 300 hours in different hospitals doing a whole lot of observation work and interviews. Um, they agree they agree design briefs, and what they mean by those are the specific things they want addressed. Then they actually issue a challenge. So it's a, like a tender for services, so they put out a challenge to all designers around the country or, or organisations and say, would any of you like to bid for this work and tackle these challenges? And that's how they do all of their work. So they issued a challenge and then they select a team or teams and they work with the different NHS trusts or hospitals then they um, come up with design ideas and they have a big show so that they can show what they've developed. And, um, and then there's a quite a long evaluation process at the end. And there's a really good um, <coughs> report on this piece of work on the Design Council website. But one of my favourite things that they did in this project was they developed the signage, which are called slices. So one of the issues that was causing violence and aggression in hospitals was actually people didn't understand the process. They didn't understand where they were in the process, what was going to happen next, or how long they were going to wait. And they developed this signage, which is really quite clever, and it's in the report, but I haven't got it with me. But each sign is, is divided into five steps. So the first step was, so, you know, where are you? Why am I here? Um, what's the most important thing I need to know, how long will I wait, and where am I going next? So all through the hospital in their accident and emergencies, they had this uniformity of signs. And it looks really good. I mean, when I look around our hospital, you know, I just wish we had something similar to that. It would make such a big difference for people. So as a result of that work, I thought a lot about New Zealand, because I mean I was really going to learn about how would that help me when I got back home, and I identified a number of challenges. Now, after I wrote this talk, I thought of about 20 more, but I thought I'd just talk about the ones that stuck out to me at the time. So for me, um, the biggest challenge in any improvement work, including co-design, is who, how we capture the experiences of people who aren't traditionally heard. I don't think we've fully worked out a way of doing that. When I talk about people who aren't traditionally heard, it might be specific groups, but it might also be people who don't engage with health services at all, who can't talk, um, perhaps they have a medical condition and they can't talk, or who are just really disengaged from society or perhaps don't trust organisations, government organisations. I've started thinking more about that and um, I think some of the ways of doing that are going more to the people and that's certainly what we've decided to do. So rather than saying, you know, we're organising a workshop, we'll organise a venue, come to us, you know, more about we're wanting to learn something and can we come to you and you host it where you feel comfortable and I think that's one way of engaging with people who have some sort of a community, but it's not the whole answer. The other challenge is increasing awareness and interest in co-design, but limited capacity. So certainly um, at Auckland City Hospital, there's a, a push towards involving patients and consumers, 
people have heard about co-design, you know, they're really quite keen to do it, but there's not actually that many people who, who feel comfortable about doing it or who really understand it. So that's quite a big issue. The third issue is the role of service designers. So in co-design, all the work that originated from England and a lot of the New Zealand work has had input from people with a service <coughs> design background. They are, they are involved in other industries, they know all the different methods. So how can we engage with those people in New Zealand? That's, that's another challenge. And the fourth challenge that I thought was really important was that I know there's lots of people doing all sorts of different work around the country and there's all different toolkits and templates, but there's no one place where you can go to get them. So, for example, um, we're doing some work now uh, redesigning a mental health facility for older people and we're facing some ethical challenges because some people are worried that if we talk to people with mental health, we might upset them. And so I sent some emails around and I found that someone at um, Counties Monica was also doing some work redesigning a mental health facility and there's other people as well, and yet there isn't one place where we can go and find out what's happening. So we end up reinventing things. But there is good news. Um, so I wanted to talk about what we've done at Auckland since I've got back from my trip. Um, the first thing we've done addresses one of those challenges around capacity. We've introduced some co-design training in our organisation, but what we've done, we've done it a little bit differently. So we've partnered with the Auckland University of Technology that actually run a service design course, and we said, can you come and teach it here, but adapt it for health? And what we started doing, the first group we've had through uh, performance improvement staff, so the people who are really good at data, processes, that kind of thing, but maybe not so good at different ways of engaging with patients and families. So those people have started off doing the course, and we've also had some clinicians, so people who are you know, really interested in co-design. So that course um, was a seven session, and it was three hours per session, and it covered the some of the topics there, which may not mean a lot, but it's design research, customer journey mapping, ideation, prototyping, service blueprinting and framing. And what they did at the end of that, they held a one day um, jam, they call it design jam in design language, where they got students, clinicians, the people who'd been on this course, and they ran through exactly what you do in the, in the steps of co-design and they actually went out and did it for a day and tried it out so they could see how the process worked right through. It was a really interesting process. We're hoping to run it again. We'll make quite a few changes, I think, but it was good to get something started. The second thing is um, something that Auckland's doing, which is really exciting. I'm not, I'm kind of involved in the periphery of this but um, they've set up what's called a Design for Health and Wellbeing Lab. So it's based on some of the work that was done in Sheffield, which I mentioned. They've actually got a physical space at the hospital. You'll see from that, it's actually like a shell, so um, there's not much in it. But it's a place where um, people can go and design and prototype services. And it's a collaboration with the Auckland University of technology, School of Art and Design. So they've got two designers working there. Um, a whole lot of students come on board and do projects so they can base themselves there, have meetings there. It's a really um, interesting space. It's very early days and there's a few projects happening. So one of the projects we're working on there is looking at first impressions. So that's um, the design of the Level 5 space at Auckland Hospital. And what I'm hoping to do, but you know, this is early days yet, is have a discovery week, which is actually a, a week where we look at all different ways of engaging with pam patients, families, consumers, 
through a whole week to really understand their experiences of what it's like to come to the hospital. But they might say no, but I thought if I said it on camera, they might <laughs> have to commit to it. <laughs> and the final example that I wanted to talk about is a co-design website which we've set up. So I talked before about how it's really hard to find out you know, what's happening in the country and what other people are doing. And seeing no one else seemed to be doing much, I decided to try and set one up myself. So it's a micro website from the HIIRC, it's Health Innovation and Something Resource Centre. So they, they helped set it up. And the idea of it is that, although um, at the moment I do most of the work, so it's got the latest news on design and co-design in health. It's got um, case studies about what's happening. It's got like a discussion area. There aren't any discussions yet, but there is a discussion area, um, place to debate things. And there's uh, going to be a whole range of tools. The idea of me setting it up is that I would set it up and everyone else would post all their stories and share their examples so that would be a place to go. It hasn't worked out that way yet. So I'm doing most of the posting. <laughs> but I'm hoping that that will change over time as more people learn about it. So anyone, it is a membership-based website. Um, that All that means is you just need to sign up for it. It doesn't cost anything. Um, and that was a Ministry of Health. They kind of own it. And they thought that was a good idea, at least for the start. And I suppose the reason for that is you're able to share and debate things which maybe you don't want to do publicly. Um, but ultimately it will be public. So it would be really, really good if everyone here today signs up. They can just email me and um, if they want, if that's the easiest way, and post something because I'd love to hear about what everyone else is doing too. And if you don't like posting, <coughs> you can just email me the stuff and I can post it for you. So that's that. So I'm coming to the end of my presentation now. I wanted to leave you with the two questions that I started with. I've changed it around a little bit. But I encourage you all to think about how you can understand people's experience of your healthcare service and how you can work together to improve them. Because I think together we can design better experiences. Thank you.